I am not hearing you. I don't know why. Oh, can you hear me now? I can. Yay. <laughs> you hang up the call and just reconnect, and then all of a sudden everything magically works. <laughs> and like, what did I do different than the last time, right? The answer is nothing. <laughs> wow. Well, it's a pleasure. Wow. So exactly. thank you so much yeah. for making the connection. A I appreciate it. A pleasure, Tanya. It's been lovely. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I might broaden the, uh, the, the audio book business this year. I wrote a blog post on it probably, I don't know, several months ago. And there are so yeah. many authors who are not playing in that arena right now and could. Mm -hmm. Some who yeah. don't even know that it's a possibility. That means there's a great opportunity for you. That's what it means. I hope so. When I first started this business over four years ago, every Australian author that I spoke to had said, um, oh, yeah, we looked into creating an audio book, but Amazon and Audible and the Audio Book Creation Exchange only allow people in from the US and from the UK. Really? They just dropped the idea then and there. So it's been quite exciting to go back to those customers and say, hey, I've done some research and um, actually we can get you published. But as you say, even within the US and the UK, there are still many authors who are kind of saying, well, you know, I, I don't really know how to do it or who I would speak to to get an audio book done and published. You know, it's funny. The very first book that I ever wrote, well, no. The one, the first one that I published or had published was in 2007. Mm -hmm. And I happened to have had a client uh, at the same time who ran a, a studio, a production studio, music, commercials, all kinds of stuff. So he had a sound, you know, stage. He recorded uh bands you know and all of that and so he's like let me do a, a, an audio book for you and i was like okay i suppose we could do that i was like i'm not sure exactly how to do that when i've got this particular book was called the loan solution mm -hmm. and so it was for small businesses who wanted to leverage their resources and get commercial uh debt and so I thought, well, how am I going to read an audio book about when I have a cash flow budget and when I have a loan amortization and all of that? <laughs> but we went into the studio and we recorded that book. And he did chapter intros and outros and he had music. It turned out lovely. I absolutely enjoyed the experience immensely. It was tremendous. It really, really was. So, um, so my very first book was an audio book, and but I'd done nothing with it. I did nothing with that audio book, other than let people know who bought the book. There's an audio version as well. That's it. Now there's a whole new world opened up. I've had a couple of clients who have content which deals with financial information, and one of them in particular is an accountant we figured that we needed to do something which was going to be able to combine audio information as well as visual information. The outstanding example was that one of the pages of her book had a cash flow projection yeah. uh, for 12 months, month by month, with um, revenue and expense items probably totaling around about 30 and it was so wide that it had been turned 90 degrees in the print book version. Yeah. And um, and we said, okay, uh, probably going, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge for people to, to listen to this. It doesn't exactly make great storytelling because, uh, of course, when you're looking at something like that, you're feature searching through the document and you're having a look to sort of, you know, pick out the interesting parts. Whereas, of course, when it's audio, it becomes a serial exercise of, start at the top left of the table and just read wow. every single row that it's just not going to fly. So we have an alternative for authors who do have some visual material that really can't be done without to understand the book. And we have a thing called a companion PDF. So what that enables the author to do is for these more complex infographics or 
diagrams which really defy a verbal explanation, then we can release this companion PDF along with the book. So when the person downloads the audio book, uh, they're also advised to either download it directly from Amazon or it's an opportunity to send the client to the author's website to download the companion PDF from there as well. So it's actually turned out to be quite a, a nice combination of the two mediums. That is true. And that's what I ended up having to do as well. So I had okay. a web, I had a website for the book where they could go and get uh, both the, the examples that were in the book, but also blank spreadsheets that they could use themselves to create their own as a result. Uh, yes, it's been handy for, um, for folks who have workbooks associated with their books um, or templates has been another, another use for the companion PDF as well. So Absolutely. we can still have a visual, uh, yeah, so we can still have a visual, visual component to the whole exercise. Can I briefly tell a story of one of the most exciting business authors? This particular uh, author has written three books and all of them are about the beauty industry. She did all three audiobooks together, one after one after the other, and we released all of them. And prior to publishing, uh, Lisa said, "Look, the first thing I need, Dave, give me a breakdown of each one of the chapters of each of the books, and have them available online, because our program, which teaches people how to run their beauty salons you know, more efficiently and with better profit and." all her various advice and coaching in the in the beauty business is that each week they run a session either in person or online and the information is based entirely on the contents of the book so the chapter for the book each week before each lesson in her program her students will click on the download link for that chapter of the book and they can have a listen to it so if they're rushing or they've run out of time to do the pre-reading for for the course prior to the lesson, then they can literally do it in the car on their on their way to class. Wow. So the, it was the audio that was broken down by chapter so that they could get it, yes. read it each time. Exactly. Ah, good. Exactly. So I think you can just have it playing through your um, playing through your phone or playing through the car stereo system. So you're able to leverage that time, which otherwise, uh, you know, would be would be wasted. So from her point of view, that became one of the core features or benefits of the audio project was that all her students could listen to the audio lesson and do the pre-listening prior to the commencement of the course each week. So she was delighted with that result. Ah, oh, yes. Yes, I can see how that would be advantageous. And, you know, as a matter of fact, the even in the primitive days when I did my audio book, it was <laughs> because he did a, an <laughs> intro and an outro with every chapter. Yeah. Mine, it also was segmented. I Mine were on CDs at the time, right? We didn't have MP3s mm -hmm. in 2007. So you could still segregate it, though, because you had the gap between chapters. So you could, uh, the the actual CD allowed you to say, okay, I want to go to chapter six. And you could do yes. that and just listen to chapter six if you wanted to. So yes, I totally see that being advantageous to be able to download chapter by chapter. For me, it was a very steep learning curve to move into publishing four years ago, Tanya, because I didn't really have any industry experience, but I had the experience with audio. Like your friend with the studio, I'd uh, recorded bands over many years and I play drums and, and sing myself. So there was kind of a natural, plus I'm a computer programmer. So it was a natural combination of those different skills. I think, as you say, there's still an unawareness of the benefit of the audio product and how it can be an ad advantageous additional format. And really, it's a complete repurposing. Your book's already been produced. It's been edited to the extent that you've written it in the storytelling voice. Then often it can just be a straight read from the book. And of course, it's in the author's voice. So if you're a public speaker or you deliver any kind of training, then people already recognize your voice. So the audio book is just another opportunity to um, to demonstrate your profile, I think. Yes, I, I agree with that. I was going to ask you, as a matter of fact, mm. do sure. all of your authors read their own books or do you 
hire voiceover actors sometimes when an author is just really not the one? Yeah, good question, Tanya. I think generally speaking, my client mix over the past four years, it's been mainly business authors followed by people providing self-help resources. And so often these people are also public speakers. And so they're generally most keen to record in their own voice. And they have the uh, the chutzpah, the confidence, and they have some speaking experience. The voice that you would use in an audio book is a little bit different to trying to project your voice over a crowd of 2,000 people in an auditorium. So it's more a more intimate style, I think, when you're recording an audio book because people are listening to you through their earpieces. So 90, I think the statistic is about 98% of my authors uh, have recorded in their own voice and generally can get away with it okay with some training. Um, there are, however, a couple of authors, not so much that they aren't confident public speakers, but they literally are, are so time poor, they want to get the audio book out there. And so there's been two or three that, that I have narrated myself. Mm. Okay, well, good. As an example. Mm. Yeah. And also we use voice actors who do some characterization where they make more extensive use of, of dialogue and, um, and role plays. I had quite a few professional voice actors who will come in to do those bit parts, which kind of gives it a little more texture and interest with a, a multitude of different voices and gives it a little more of a radio play kind of feel. Yeah, yes. I can, I can just imagine that actually. Now, are, yeah. Are those authors, do those authors tend to be fiction authors then, or do the nonfiction authors still want the characterization? It's a, a combination of both. I ha I've done um, about five or six works of fiction, Tanya, so that's a, an area of the business that I'm, I'm very interested to, to explore. More often than not, the fiction authors that I've spoken to, and, and we've discussed the option for a for an audio book, uh, the majority of those authors were saying, oh, no, no, this is not something that I would do in my own voice. So in those yeah. cases, we will recommend, recommend a voice actor. M not so much that they couldn't do it and give a credible performance, but the problem is that um, voice actors are able, and I don't know how they do it, but they are able to retain, you know, six or seven different male and female characters. So there are, there are female uh, voice actors who will, do an incredibly convincing male voice and have three different three different personalities for that particular male voice that also carry off another you know three or four female characters and be able to just switch in and out of these personalities while recording so it's an art an art form yeah yeah it is i want to convince one of my daughters to do it as a side gig voice acting because they do such a good job um for example she yeah. can do the British woman, she can do the uh, Scottish person, she can do the the boy who talks, the, I, I, oh my gosh, it's just amazing what she can do with voice <laughs> characterization. And they literally do this reading yes. to one another. So, for yes. example, they can take a Harry Potter book and they will read the book to the opposite person and they will get into character, voice character for each of the people who are in the the segment that they're reading. It just blows yes, me away. Absolutely. It is and extraordinary, Tanya. Yes. Go ahead, please. So I I would just love now my daughter is by training a mechanical engineer and an astronomer. But I would love for her to get wow. a side gig. <laughs> Well, she's absolutely welcome. What I offer at my website or part of my business is we have what they refer to as a roster of, of voice actors. So I have a profile in there which will include a photograph of the voice actor, a an audio sample. So they will send me what we call a sizzle reel, which is a, a bunch of examples of different styles. So it illustrates their range. Everything from younger children through to older men or a particular style, which may be more business informative for training courses through to dramatic pieces that they've read. All I usually need is a, a profile picture, a short sort of two paragraph biography that talks about the voice actor themselves and a sizzle reel. Usually, you know, they're usually two to three minutes long. And what happens is that when my authors call for a voice actor, 
then I can send them to this page and they can listen to a range of different genders, different vocal styles. And that's sort of a growing part of the business, actually. It's been lovely. So I just look oh, after yeah. the, the narrators. I don't make money from them. I, I, I don't like the sound of that because I don't think I add any value. That, they are the ones who add the value to it. So it's usually by introduction. And then we all collaborate together in the audio book project and uh, basically write the radio play and then off we go. So I'd, so I'd love to hear from your daughter. <laughs> well, that would be fun. I will, I, will yeah. definitely, I will definitely bring that up when she comes back out of her research lab today. Gotcha. That okay. Is- and what a, what a relief from a very serious science and technology kind of career to, to do something so dramatic and fun. And creative. All of my daughters have been, uh, they're all thespians. They've all done plays and uh, musical theater and things of that nature. So they they are characters already. So it is really a play off of one another. It's amazing. Now, I have been a public speaker. One of my earlier audiobook clients, Tanya, has written a book about business storytelling. So their history was quite an interesting one because at the time they begun this process, around about the same time that we're talking about when you recorded your audio book. So it was around about 2007, 2006, that sort of time frame. And they had a terrible time trying to sell this business storytelling idea to very serious corporations who were saying, but hang on a sec, we make all the PowerPoint slides and we give town hall presentations and people listen to all of that and they understand it all and these guys actually challenged that assumption and said look that's great do you mind if we come into your business and actually test to see how well your corporate messages are coming across to your staff and it came back with these terribly abysmal recall rates and (laughs) people were asked about the mission of the company and said well look I don't really know you know (laughs) I don't understand so all of a sudden they've said if you can convey that information through story, through an anecdote, then all of a sudden that's something that, you know, our memories are, are better designed to um, to clap onto and it creates a stronger memory surface. A story is more memorable than a, than a set of rules or a set of statistics. So in that way, I guess you guys were doing the same thing with your trading programs is you're actually bringing faces and flesh and blood to the stories rather than just being expected to read a 200-page document. That's true. And when you are... We were literally audit professionals. So you can imagine how dry that would be if all you had to do was read an audit manual to try to learn something new uh, for your line of work. So, yes, you're right about that. But what's interesting now that you mentioned that is the trend over the past several years, I've met many business storytellers who Mm -hmm. are doing great business now, mind you. Yeah, so I've seen a big trend uh, towards that. And it it really is true. It really does help you to remember more and to emote that feeling. So who is it? Was it my answer or somebody who says, you know, people remember how you made them feel, right? When speakers are up there doing presentations about something, if that, Information is good, but uh, yeah, I, I I didn't get much out of it. But if you make them, if you bring that story to life, if you take that information and put it in story form, then they can feel and connect and they can say, oh my gosh, that was the greatest thing ever. I learned this, I learned that, I learned the yes. other. And as you said, the recall is improved. Yeah, and I think the other the other lovely aspect too is not only the ability to retain the information, but also because again, like we are so genetically wired to pay attention to things that that impact on our emotions. So for instance, stories about injury or stories about danger, stories about children, or or stories about you know, oh my goodness, you know, I, I can really feel what it was like for you in that situation. I'm really glad that it wasn't me. (laughs) I think they call that, what's that called? A schadenfreude story. And so um, you have this incredible opportunity to not only um, be able to retain that information because it's made an emotional impact, but also there's a tendency to share that same emotional impact when you then tell the story to someone else. So it helps with the 
Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? With the, dis the dispersal of, of information and in businesses, it helps distribute and reinforce the culture, I think. And they've gone on from strength to strength. So tell me, how do you now, how do you market your business and who do you seek? Who is your ideal client right now? Good question, Tanya. I think there are two or three customer avatars that I have in mind. So from an ideal point of view, I, at, at, the, at the moment, um, I do have a marketing campaign and it's how I found you, fortunately, is by looking for book coaches. Let's get the commercial motivation out of the way first. And that is that people who are coaching others to write books, either ghostwriting for them or helping them write themselves, they tend to know lots of authors. So instead of me trying to find each individual author and approach them directly, there's potential for me to um, pick up some referral business through people who are involved in book coaching or are sold on the idea that, um, that a business book in particular can be such an incredible profile booster and, and can also bring a lot of professional services income into your business. So that's the current campaign. So I guess that's one avatar. So book coaches, um, the other central one is independent publishers here throughout Australia and now overseas. Oftentimes, the question will come up to these publishers saying, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm asked a lot of the time, what do I do if I want an audio book version of my book? So I'll often catch those authors when they're uh, either in the middle of or approaching the end or have already completed their print and ebook publishing journey and are looking for another another opportunity to um, to promote their book. And that's something that the audio book represents. You know, if it's 12 months out since the release, then you have an opportunity to run another media campaign to promote the audio book. Well, that's good. That's really interesting because a lot of my authors are business and self-help authors. So a lot Fantastic. of my clients are there. Oh, that's I'd say grand. the majority, that's actually. Can I ask you the question? What brought you into your current business at the moment? I noticed you're a qualified MBA and your story about auditing suggests that you've been you've been to some of the places earlier in your career that I that I've been to as well. I worked as an auditor for two years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and as you say, and as you say, it 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 doesn't it doesn't make for an exciting romance novel, really. <laughs> Yes. How did you come into coaching authors and helping them publish books? Well, you know, it's so interesting. I, When I look back now, I feel like I have been groomed for this the entire time. In my young life, all of my studies were in business. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, I, when I worked with the international uh, professional services firm, I actually worked in professional development. So we were training okay. everybody who came in from first year, first day, through partner. And so where I shined in that was not only in helping subject matter experts to create content, but in doing the editorial to make sure that they polished it and ensure that there were no errors in our copy because it had a one-year shelf life. And we didn't want an error hanging around for a year, right? Sure. And it, and it was going international, so it was like, ah, we can't have mistakes anywhere. So I became a real stickler for how things uh, looked, how they read, how they, you know, were presented. And yes, it, it came to me that if you wanted to just slip something out the door and you didn't really care whether it was perfect. But if they wanted it to be perfect, then they made sure it went <laughs> off my desk. I love that style that you have to, to help craft and, and perfect. It's worked across the numeric world and the, and the literary world, yeah? Yes, indeed. And then as time <laughs> went on, I moved into different things. But I always ended up in some kind of editorial role in addition to whatever my primary function was. So I was a mm -hmm. director of small business development centers, and I used to train thousands of small business people how to launch, grow, um, nurture, and, you know, sell their businesses. And at the same time, I was the editor of the newsletters for the network and, you know, all those other things. So I always had my hand 
on the editorial. Yeah. Well, yes. in one, one particular contract, I was doing training and consulting for a business center and a new director came in who happened to, on the side, do self-publishing consulting and training. Young authors who wanted to publish a book, right? And so yes. mm -hmm. just uh, being, I don't know, supportive and everything else, I said, well, let me go to one of your workshops. And so yes. I, I went and I did the exercises just like everybody else who was there. I, I acted as a participant and I came out with the thought that, you know what, maybe I should just go ahead and, and, and take that chapter. I was writing a chapter for a bigger book. Yeah, I should just publish that as its own standalone book. She introduced me to a small publisher. They convinced me to go ahead and do this. And so I ended up publishing my first book as a result of that. Well, as time went on, Fantastic. I already had a small business consulting firm at this time. And mm -hmm. she convinced me because I was doing so much. I was helping her so much with her thing. She was like, Tanya, you really need to do this for other people. You really need to mm. do this as a business. It never occurred to me. It sometimes takes somebody else to point out the elephant in the room. So you're just saying, what elephant? <laughs> right. Right. You mean the one standing on my foot right now? That one? Yeah. yeah. So that's... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So it takes so, yes. someone else to actually see the, see the beauty in you or the... The skill or the or the opportunity it's amazing how dealing with other people it's 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 mandatory isn't it we, we just don't necessarily see this stuff in ourselves that is it is often true and so yeah what ended up happening is while i was still running this first business i created a second business doing editorial services for independent authors and Fantastic. that's where it all started about it'll be it's probably about 15 years ago, maybe, maybe I'm going on 16. I don't remember now. So that's how mm. long. And I ended up getting out of the direct business consulting and moving totally into the publishing realm, the whole um, author services realm. So it later came to, I started with the editing, but moved into manuscript evaluations and then moved into ghostwriting. And now it's just all of the above and the book coaching. Uh, your your business um, has done all of the hard work by the time the uh, by the time the author comes to me. You know, without all the amazing work that, that you book coaches have done either on behalf of or, or along with your authors, I wouldn't have any content for people to be uh, recording. <laughs> right, that's right. And we want to make sure that it is worthy, at least my company. We want to make sure that that mm -hmm. book is worthy of recording and yes. that it's worthy of bestseller status. I don't want people just throwing something out there and saying, okay, I got a book. And it's like, no, 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 you don't. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. But I help them to make sure that they actually look good in print and don't look foolish, don't look like an amateur, don't look, you know, I want them to look good. One of the key principles for my business is is around the quality of the audio product that we're that we're producing, and there's still quite a a range of sounds. So, for example, um, when speaking to new podcasting clients, the first thing and and audio book clients, of course, too, the, is the quality of their microphone, their ability to create a quiet environment. And do all of that stuff up front because for a 40,000 word book, you're going to spend up to eight hours at the microphone recording that because there'll be a few fluffs that you make where you, you mispronounce or you misread a sentence, you need to read it again. So it's quite a significant time commitment to, to do the recording. And I always suggest the authors actually do it um, in their own homes, which has been a little bit of a controversial um, suggestion as it turned out but once people have done it if you're at home and you want some flexibility then they'll probably sit down for two hours in the evening so all of the all of the wildlife is asleep all of the ch you know the children are asleep the, the dogs and cats have all settled down and it means that when you're recording to go for two hours it and I always put it to authors this way when they often they'll, they'll say to me oh look you know it's only a 40,000 word book I'll be able to record the whole book in one day 
And I said, well, just think about it a little bit. You're a public speaker. When was the last time that you spoke flat out with professional enthusiasm and gained the attention of an audience for eight hours straight? When have you ever done that? <laughs> and, there's a, and there's usually a silence at the end of it. And uh, it's kind of, okay, I see what you mean. So from my point of view, you get the, you get a much better result. You get a more enthusiastic and, and, uh, and professional read if people actually narrate and record for one to two hours at a maximum in a setting and then just leave it until the following night and then do the next, the next two or three chapters. But um, I think this is where the studio model can be a bit, um, can be a bit more difficult. But you can probably reflect to me on that one. You, you've been in a studio to record your audio book. Did you, did you do it all within one day? You know, I was, I was thinking back as you were speaking and I, mm -hmm. I, I believe we did it all in one day. I'm trying to think. I do not recall having to come back. I really don't. I believe okay. we did it all in one day. Now, when I was going to ask you a question, there are two different thoughts yes, that came out when you were talking. Yes. One, I talked you. eight hours straight, three, five days in a row. It is exhausting. So, yes, I agree with you. On that. <laughs> and, Thank you. And, and two, one of the questions I had was, does mm -hmm. their voice change? from one chapter to another, if they're doing two hours here and two hours there, let's say that they get through, you know, I don't know how many chapters that means. Do you it, have to make adjustments then for the difference in their sound from one session to the next? I take, I take your question there, Tanya. So, so in, my, in my experience, what tends to happen in a single day recording, and there are still, I mean, despite my advice, I'm only coming up with really offering a generalization to people. So it won't be a one size fits all bit of advice. So just because I suggest to do it a certain way doesn't mean it's gonna suit the person who's, who's asked for my advice. So, but again, in general terms, what tends to happen is you can clearly hear the difference between the narration, enthusiasm, the intonation, the cadence, the the variation, emotion, and also the pacing is almost exclusively better in the earlier part of the day compared to the afternoon. By the afternoon, things tend to flatten off. So to answer the first question first, that's what I've experienced in most cases um, with a you know, Dave, I've blocked out a day to, to do the recording. So, you know, let's either do it together or, or they do it independently, whichever. And um, and that's been my experience. So often what, what will happen is that we'll actually set aside um, two recording days. I'll listen to the recording from, from the previous day or have already listened to it. And I've captured that change that you're talking about, that change in enthusiasm or, or mood or tone and picked out the chapters that I'd like them to read again, because most authors tend to find their voice by the time they've got to about chapter three. So as a mandatory experience, what tends to happen is I'll ask the author to record the introduction and chapter one again after they've got to the end of the book, because by that stage, their narration muscle is nice and well toned. They have found their voice along the way, but in the first two chapters, they're still kind of finding their way. It's a combined answer to your question, I guess. So what I tend to find is that if they do record over, over different nights, because we have set them up in, say, for instance, most commonly it's the home office. So we have a carpeted, it's got a carpeted floor. Um, you've got some uh, soft furnishings in the room around you, you know, usually a, uh, what do you call it, a sofa. So you've got a sofa preferably a bookshelf, and all of these things make for a lovely ambient sound in the room, which gives you something very close to the kind of soundproofing that a studio has. And because it's the same environment, same microphone, and that there tends to be not an enormous amount of variation in mood if you record over a number of different days. So generally speaking, it's, it's, not, it's not an issue. Well, good, yeah. That, that's a very good point, though, having them we read the info and in chapter one at the end. I like that approach because you're right. They are going to feel a lot more comfortable as time goes on with the reading. 
and they're likely mm. to present themselves a lot better as time goes on. So that's a good idea. Exactly, Tanya. The other thing that tends to be affected in, in the early part of the narrative, um, and this is despite the fact that, you know, this, sorry, on top of the fact that, you know, I've provided some voice coaching for them and some suggestions around narration. And one of the, um, one of the things that I'm, and I'm sure Americans in particular find this very frustrating when they're talking to Australians, is that we seem to speak at double the rate of most Americans. And as a result, we don't pronounce the words. You know, there is this kind of slurry of speech that comes out. I, I do often find with, um, with, uh, with I've, I have personally slowed down my own speech because once you get used to narrating, you, you realise that with an audio book, if your listener thinks that you're speaking too slowly, they can just speed you up. They can multiply the speed of your voice by, you know, one and a half times or or double the speed. So if you're speaking too slowly, the listener can, they can control um, whether you're um, sending them to sleep or not. That's that's something something for them. But, um, but so as a result of that, when you're doing the original audio book recording, it doesn't matter if you feel that you're speaking a little slower than you normally would because for most Australian authors, for example, if I can slow them down by, by 20%, then you know there's a chance of them being better understood and they don't start mispronouncing and slurring words and missing syllables, things, things like that, which from the listener's point of view, um, you, get the, you gain the impression that the author is just in a huge hurry to finish this job and you know, get out of the recording studio. And if you're listening to someone tell an anecdote, you don't want that anxious feeling that you're listening to somebody telling a story who really is in a huge hurry to get off the phone. Do, do you see the point that I'm making? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and then too, I mean, if you speed up blurred speech and you know mispronunciation, <laughs> it's just going to yeah. sound worse. You know. So. Exactly, exactly. And I've had authors who have read read that way for the first two chapters and uh, and I've had to call them back as, you know, with all dispatch as quickly as possible and saying, you can't do it. You, you've got to stop doing it this way. They can be sensitive conversations because it can be dangerous territory. I think you have to be diplomatic when you're talking to somebody about the way they speak, the quality of their voice. You know, it's something that's very personal and very... Uh, very important to all of us. I mean, it's how we communicate. You know, it's how, it's our sound to the whole to the whole world. But every now and again, I, I do I do have to be a little uh, a little firm with them and just saying, look, it, you are galloping. I can hear you slurring the words. I can't. Re there are parts that I can't understand. And I'm only telling you this because this is the impression that your listener is going to get. And this recording of the book that we're doing might go out to 10,000 people. And so there are 10,000 people <laughs> we're thinking of here. So maybe let's just slow down. They can always speed you up if they need to, but let's just go nice and slow, pronounce every word clearly for the, for the book. And then again, it's like your editorial point, Tanya, it's uh, you are producing something which is going to have a shelf life. Well, in your, your case, it was an entire year for the content. So it has to be right. And in the case of an audio book, it's a perpetual product. It's going to be out there forever. Correct. That is right. So it might be a bit. You know, and I tell my authors that too when it comes to the editing of their book because mm -hmm. they're like, well, you know, why do I really need to pay for a professional edit? You know, can I just have my mother's brother yeah. sister who used to be an English teacher? Can I just have her take a look at it? She says it's pretty good. Well, Mm. You could, but then do you really want to risk having the reviews saying, oh, it was good content, but man, I couldn't get over all those errors and I just had to stop reading. I mean, I have stopped reading things when I find too many errors. I'm just like, if you don't care enough about what you're presenting to me, how can I believe you care enough about your topic to be thorough or your expertise that yeah. you can share with me? So they, right. oh, well, I'm just publishing it on, on Amazon. I'll just redo it and put up another one. Mm -hmm. Well, in the meantime, all that marketing you did for your book launch, the first 
thousand copies yeah. have gone out to people with all of those errors. And your impression yeah. has already been set. And they're already saying good book, but really sucks in terms of production. So, you know. Yeah. Yep. Start out right. Yeah, you know, absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Right. I, th I think that's where the quality assurance is, you know, the most important step. And I, I think it's really, it's the same for the, for the audio. So in the, in the same way that Tanya is, is ensuring that, that the written words are put together properly. And it's like the story of the three little pigs, you know, if you are littered with um, spelling errors and bad grammar and, you know, whatever, you know, in the extreme case, I'm sure this is not representative of many of your, your customers, of course, but it's amazing how once something is of a high standard, that something as simple as a spelling error or a very difficult bit of sentence logic can really take you out of the flow of the story that you're being told. You don't want to build a house out of straw, you know, you want it to be you want it to be built out of out of bricks and that's the 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 durable the durable product. That's absolutely right. I I believe that it is good that you offer the vo voice coaching. And I say that because mm -hmm. I grew up hard of hearing. So there are certain sounds that I never heard growing up. So articulating oh. them are harder for me. So okay. it's good to have someone who can help point out, well, I never hear the R or I don't hear the S when you're speaking. If you're told those things, you can pay attention to them. But if you're not told, yeah. you just keep going as if everything is okay. But yes. I was hard of hearing and I did not know there were certain letter sounds. I received a hearing aid when I was in uh, high school, like ninth grade. Mm -hmm. And I had to take speech therapy as a result because I could hear these sharp sounds that I'd never heard before. It's like, ah, yeah, what is right. that? <laughs> right. It was like a like a different like the world sounded different overnight. Yeah. Like at the at the just a turn of a yeah. page and all of a sudden your world sounded different. How incredible. Yes, it absolutely uh was interesting. And there's still because I haven't been wearing those hearing aids for years, there are still sounds that I cannot make out. And when I I, I appreciate, even though I'm not on camera, I appreciate your being on camera. This computer doesn't have <laughs> cam camera or sound. So I have to use my phone okay. and then use the computer. And I want my yeah. computer because this is a really big screen, but I can also put yes. files when I need to. And I don't have those on any other device. So it's like, ah, I've got to get an yeah. all and I will, I will. But One day. It, hel it helped me to see people speak. Because then if I did, didn't quite get it, I, add, I I have all of this calculation going on in my head every moment that says, okay, he said this, but his lips moved this way and it sounded like this and then blah, blah, blah. And so it must, he must have said this. And that's how Fantastic. I have to process sometimes. Amazing. That's so interesting to, to hear, Tanya. It tightly binds your, your audio sense with your with your visual sense so that you know both of those channels are working together to to sort out the message so yeah, how am i oh, look i would have never i would have never guessed i mean you speak so you speak so beautifully your enunciation is is absolutely beautiful i wouldn't suspect for a minute that you'd had any kind of um any kind of hearing um uh, you know hearing loss or hearing impediment that's that's uh, that's amazing work and from such a young age i guess um while we're on the subject of, um, you know, that we're not all we're not all built to the perfect design, um, given that we're on camera now. So this is Dave. So I was born I was born without a left hand. So this has been me from the very get go, and uh, really? as opposed to you, where you, where hearing was discovered at at nine years of age. I mean, you know, they knew as soon as I popped out. They said, "Oh, you know, hi There's Wendy, you've had missing. a lot. You've had a beautiful." Yeah, you've got a beautiful young son, but there's there's just this thing I got to tell you about. And Mum said a million things went through her mind, and then um, and then the doctor said, look, he's been born with just you know with just one hand. So, but again, you know, we adapt to how it goes. You know, I've got a bit of a wrist, so I can still carry boxes and you know water ski, snow ski. I think I mentioned before that I play drums. Yeah, 
That's right. <laughs> That's always a good one for people to get their head around. <laughs> That's right. Now, can you risk on your left hand move that much that it can hold drumsticks as well, or are you just so fast Not, with your other hand? Oh, how cool. What a great question, Tanya. So the two big friends in my life have been, um, when I say um, neoprene, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Neoprene, it's a, a wetsuit material, yeah? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Or, yeah, and um, and Velcro. Ah, yeah. Velcro tape. There it is. Those two, if you, exactly, if you put that together in your mind, then that becomes the cuff that goes around and the drumstick is actually attached, you know, very flexibly with the rubber, the Velcro, so you can have it kind of tight but a bit loose, you know, just to give that flexibility. Awesome. That's amazing. So, <laughs> so now I'm curious, how were your parents in terms of upbringing? Did they say, oh, no, little baby, you can't do that. You don't have a left hand. Or did they say, here, get this, do this, take this, as if you have the left hand anyway? How how did they? That's a great question. I suppose, um, well, be, being both uh, very independent people themselves, I think their natural their natural reaction was to say, look, it's going to be a combination of a little bit of help from us for you know to get you on your way, how to how to adapt. But really, the idea was to try and teach teach the ability to adapt to me, so that I could do it myself. I think that was the general the general principle. Mm -hmm. And and there's a very uh, there's a brief um, uh, a brief anecdote about that. At four years of age, we have schooling over here in Australia called um, kindergarten. Is is there a similar? What what do you call it over in the states, Tanya? Do you, do you call it kindergarten? Mm -hmm. Kindergarten. And so I was at at four at four years of, yeah before years of age, and at one kindergarten session, we were tasked the whole whole group of kids by the kindergarten teacher said, "I want you all to go home and I want you to try and tie your shoelaces tonight." Try and learn how to tie your shoelaces. And um, there's a longer version of this story, but the short version of the story is that night I went home and somehow figured out how I would um, tie my shoelaces. And I was one of three children who came back the following day who could tie their shoelaces. So what does wow. that say about me? Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. That is awesome. Oh, that's really that's really neat. That's oh, thank you, that thank you. Tremendous. So those who know me tend to describe me as, um, on the one hand, very patient, but on the other hand, very determined. Ah. <laughs> good, good. So there's a bit of yin and yang there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could be a very good thing. Now, back to your business. I had a question. I want to make sure I don't forget to ask. And you mentioned. And podcasters. You mentioned mm -hmm. podcasters. Do you work with uh, authors or anyone who wants to do a podcast and needs to have it recorded appropriately? What do you do with them? Yeah, ab absolutely, Tanya. Well, so to some degree, the um, the podcasting was a natural follow on from the audiobook. So I didn't actually. It wasn't on my radar in the first instance when the the business idea was first put to me. I wasn't considering podcasting at all because I sort of thought, well, I'm not sure. Like, I, I, you know, and again, back to the back to the commercial side of things that I, I could see how someone would pay for a service to have an audio book produced. Um, but because podcasting is still and, and it's terrific that it is, but it's still provided for free. So I was concerned that it would become perhaps, you know, an optional charitable side of the of the business, but I didn't really direct a lot of energy into it. But uh, that is now that is now changed in my mind because I feel that podcasts now uh, are now a completely legitimate media channel. So we now identify podcast interviews with something closer to being published in the local newspaper or getting a radio, you know, or perhaps a television interview. So it now has a place as a very valid media. And I, and I imagine you probably encourage a lot of your authors to, whilst they're promoting their books, to get onto those podcasts and offer yourself as a, an interview guest because it's an incredible way of spreading the word. From my point of view, I kind of came into it bit by bit. And I mentioned the uh, business storytelling client 
earlier, immediately after finishing his audio book, it was actually part of his plan was to um, arrange a podcast. So I kind of was thrown into podcast production in the in the first instance. And now production at the moment, I'm running five, producing five different podcasts, and I'm in the process of helping set up another two. So from that point of view, it's really, again, we're back to some very similar principles there, there Tanya. You have... Um, in order to record your audio book, um, you need to be set up in a good situation, have a good recording environment, adequate equipment, and you need to test it. You need to have somebody with you who can tell you what the direction is away from the microphone. One of the classic mistakes people make is that they put the microphone right in front of their mouth. Mm. And what that means, every time you say P or B, any of those plosive consonants, yeah. you get that that boof on the on the mic have you heard that before yes i have absolutely yeah so it was so in that respect it was kind of a natural progression from from audiobooks into into podcasts people i think now are starting to become a little more savvy in terms of the quality of the audio that they want to listen to when they're doing a podcast now the current price for around about 120 dollars us you can buy, you can be the proud owner of a studio quality microphone. The, the technology has become so tremendous in its quality, uh, as long as it's implemented properly, that, you know, $120, that you can, you can buy that microphone and that'll get you through your audio book and you can use it for all of your podcast interviews or run, run your, own, your own podcast series. Wow. So, and that microphone can be used in a variety of uh, settings, meaning I have a uh, partially defunct Mac on one side and I have a PC on another. Can the microphone mm-hmm. go both ways? Yep. Plugs right into the um, into the USB socket. Oh, good. Okay. Well, that's, yeah. that's, so that's good to remember. It's kind of a mindset shift, I think, for, for authors and podcasters to explore What are preconceived ideas? What are stereotypical ideas around what your recording environment should look like, um, where you record, how you record, who you record with? So I think to some degree, um, really all I'm doing with people is just looking at an alternative way of doing the process. Fundamentally, it's so much cheaper to do a very brief experiment. You know, literally, it's $120 for for the microphone. The recording software you can use is free and you already have your, your laptop, and most people have some kind of home office, so it's a very, it's a very cheap experiment. And, and if you don't like it, if it didn't give you the result that you wanted to, then you absolutely have the option to, to return to the studio. I don't know, that's, not blowing no, my own trumpet, but well, that's I've got a, some good that's a good thing. <laughs> yes, it's good that you have Thank that you. expertise. Well, you know, I would be interested in, in learning if you want to send me a link to what uh, mm-hmm. that microphone is and hopefully you have it linked to the microphone do you you have an no, affiliate link you I need don't to do at that. The moment. i don't at the moment tanya that's a very clever idea thank you i again another one of those elephants in the room <laughs> that's right but yes anything <laughs> that you recommend by all means you recommend it anyway you know it's good yes. you use it so why not share yes. a little in the benefit of sharing it so, yeah, get it, an affiliate link for that before you send it to me. Thank you. <laughs> I, I certainly will. That's as, plain, that's as plain as the nose on my face now that you've pointed it out to me. <laughs> yes. yes, that's absolutely right. And, and, and you know, quite frankly, I mean, speaking of, of thoughts and ideas, if you're working mm-hmm. with an author who's going to begin recording either their audio book or either or a podcast series, maybe even based on their book, could provide a uh, a podcast bundle or an author, an audio book bundle that has the affiliate link to the microphone, might have, you know, even though it's free, you can send the link to Audacity or whatever the free software is that you recommend. Yes. Yeah, you know, a list guess. of the resources becomes the bundle, even if some of it is free. And then some of your yeah. your advice and the instruction and guidance that you give them, like avoiding the P's and the explosions in their microphone, yeah. that yeah. would be in a PDF, it's a little tiny ebook that's um, 
packaged with that bundle that oh, they could buy. Oh, Daniel, I would buy. love your advice. I would love your advice around that because having spent so much of my life in a technical role, so I'm a, I'm a software developer by trade. That's what I've spent 30 years of my of my career doing. And one thing I've learned about being in IT is that you are all about process, all about process, describing every little tiny detail and to reflect back on a comment you made earlier, to make some interesting presentations about auditing. I think it's just as challenging to do that for, for, an, for an IT guy who's saying, well, you plug that into there and this, and then you'll set this to a certain level. And I'm listening to myself going, I don't even want to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> so I would love, I would love your, uh, I would love your, um, your um, editorial eye to, you know, not so much fix up all my spelling mistakes, although that is very important, but, you know, but more the, um, you know, I'm just reading Dave's story and, you know, I'm just not getting it. Like, you know, it's oh, just, yeah. That doesn't it's make sense. How do you go from this it, to that? That's right. That's exactly right. And again, back to back to the viewpoint. You know, somebody else's uh, somebody else's viewpoint is so important with this stuff because you you become too close to it. Yeah. Absolutely. You do need that pair of eyes. So I totally totally get that. Now I'll tell you, I have toyed around for years, mind you, years, mm -hmm. uh, with doing a a podcast. And mm. I never have. I mean, I've been interviewed okay. on podcasts and I love it. I have so much fun. Yeah. Love yes. the interview. Bye. It's like this conversation. I, it's so yeah. much fun. Yeah. It is. It is. And so, yep. you know, I've thought about, you know, I, I did a few videos, you know, a, a chat with your editor is what I called it. I did a few videos saying, mm -hmm. well, maybe I can make do a YouTube series and I just answer those common questions that I get and and I thought, well, why not do that with a, as a podcast and you know, take all of those different blog posts that I might write and and turn it into a blog, you know, a podcast also and yada yep. yada. Boy, I tell you, I can't tell you how many times I've been told to do it. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked if I have one, and I don't. So my question Isn't it to incredible? You is, yes. Yeah, it's like it's it's such a no brainer, you know, that if you have information that people need want and are constantly asking about why not share it in a way that they can get it. But my question to you is for people like mm. me, how do mm -hmm. you help them with the podcast if, for example, you know, they say, oh, everything is just so easy. You can just do it yourself now. Get your own mic, like you're telling them, Get create this environment, do it yourself. Well, why then would I go to an expert like you if yeah. I want to do a podcast? Help me to understand that. Give me, give me that compelling, you know, <laughs> you know, competitive advantage you have over DYI. Okay, okay. That's a, yeah, that's a fair, that's a fair question, Tanya, a very fair question. And, um, People have again. A lot of this is about um, preconceived ideas, or or also just not knowing how the whole thing is is put together. Well, yeah. Let's let's debate the topic in terms of what Tanya does for her customers. People come people come to you, I imagine, with a, a whole lot of different ideas about um, what they want to write. They've got concepts. They've got maybe they've thought of maybe ten different expertise areas that they think may track towards chapters in the book. They're not sure what sort of voice to write in. Uh, they're unsure of what to include and what not to include. And so from your point of view, Tanya, you're giving advice. You start laying out a plan, which is to say, well, you know, maybe there's a framework that we can start elaborating over time. It looks a bit fuzzy at the moment, but we might just lay these ideas out first, brainstorm a bit here. We'll take these bits of content here. We'll work on this and bring that all together. So there's a kind of a molding process that, that goes on when you're writing a book. And I think it's no different with a podcast. You first need to go through those early stages of what is my podcast going to be about in two or three words. So you need a two or three word name for what your podcast series is going to be called. One of them, for example, that, that I work with at the moment, she is a, a comedian and she interviews comedians on stage 
live at uh -huh. comedy venues. So at the uh -huh. end of the comedian's performance, we'll sit down on chairs together in front of a live audience and she will interview these, these comedians. The qualification for the comedian is that they have to have done some writing. A lot of, lot of comedians are script writers. You know, they're often incredibly good writers. And uh, so that's the qualification to go on to the Funny About Books podcast. Then the next stage of elaboration we went through was, well, that's what it's called, but what is your podcast series going to be about? Tagline for the, for the podcast is Melbourne comedian Stella Kinsella speaks to fellow comedians at Melbourne clubs live on stage. So now we've got the name and we've got what the series is about. And then we said to Stella, okay, so you have a show once a month. You're going to have uh, two or three interviews every time it runs. Comedy routine. Then the podcast interview would occur. I'd record them live on stage, which is tremendous, of course, because you get the, the laughter and the gasp responses from the audience as well. So it gives you a, a great live feel of actually, you know, being there. And from there, we will write a synopsis for each episode. So we maybe write four or five paragraphs which is what, what the show was about and what the highlights and the features were. And then we produce and uh, attach the audio and release the podcast episode. Going to get your, um, your following through the different podcast channels at uh, you know, Apple and um, Spotify, Google Podcasts. So all of those things together. So it's very much a, it's very much a literary exercise and the audio sort of uh, helps to support the support what's uh, what's written about so i don't know yeah. does that did i did i answer any of your question there at all <laughs> yes i mean first of all it just helps you to see the uh, the big picture of the whole podcast experience it's more than just yeah. that little bit of voice work that's good to know and your role in those things is I mean, like for the synopsis, yeah. are you writing that for them? Often, I'm dealing with I'm dealing with with authors and people who who write for a living. So to right. be asked to write for them is a, is a great honor, and I love doing it. But I'm also relieved about the fact that I only have to write, you know, four or five paragraphs. I'll spend up to half an hour or an hour on one of those, just because of the audience that I'm writing for but also you know to try and craft something which is punchy and concise so but generally speaking the podcast hosts will write those synopses themselves yep and then i will just kind of publish them on their behalf and attach the audio so the audio part of it is usually in editing the episode including some music on the top or the tail of the the podcast a zoom experience and that's how most of the podcasts have been recorded you know in, in certainly in melbourne in the last nine months that occasionally there will be a dropout and so we we need to edit those pieces out things like that it's not a heavy edit when it comes to podcasts you want to you want to keep it sounding conversational and uh and keep the flow going i think tanya is it your feeling with podcasts do you enjoy the more conversational ones yes i do and I just cannot tell you an interview that I've ever had that I have not enjoyed, radio or yeah. podcasting. Fine. I absolutely love it. I have so much fun. And one of the things that I wanted to do was also interview others on mm. my podcast, uh, but yes. I wanted to be very specific. So I went, there were going to be, yeah. the way I saw it was there would be Let's say I did a weekly episode. So one would be an interview. Three would be topics uh -huh. where I'm addressing questions that I'm constantly getting. And yes, then I bring yes, in a great interview idea. Interview and blah blah blah. So I love I that see, mix. I love that mix that variety. That's a great idea. Yeah, and what I discovered, I was trying to find. I was trying to find a podcast I wanted, and could not. So, ah, that's good. That's how you discover the gaps in the marketplace, isn't it? Well, right. But then I thought, you know, when you have yeah. gaps in the marketplace, you also think, well, then there's no market for that because it's not there. Ah, and therefore, I'd have sword. to educate, yeah. right? I'd have to educate the market. Yeah. So I, I don't want to do yes. that. But I just felt no. like there wasn't what I was looking for already out there. And so... 
Okay. You know, every once in a while, I, I, I have a sticker literally on my bulletin board that's been there forever that says, Yeah, what does it say? Series. And it's still sticking. <laughs> Somehow or another, the stick still stickies. I, I, I don't know how it's still up there. But anyway, one of these days, I'll, how right. do you, how do you price your uh, podcast services? Because there's, mm -hmm. there's two thoughts that I'm running through right now. If yes. I'm, I'm still working on fleshing out my goals for 2021. And yep. I don't know for sure that podcasting is going to be one of them, but I, I love the idea and I am still mm. considering that. And it might be a way for me to produce content on a more regular basis several months work before I launch anything, you know, I if don't know if that's doing a weekly podcast, 10 episodes in the can at a minimum. Otherwise your week eight becomes a nightmare because you've got two episodes left to do. Then you're stuck with chasing your tail every single week and always being late and potentially right. missing the, um, missing that lovely routine that your listeners have got used to. It's amazing how people can, once they get into a podcast that they like, they will make that recurring reminder on their phone to to go and pick up the new episode so yeah your, your instincts are right Tanya yeah please go on all right so what I was thinking was this if I if podcasting ends up on my final goals for 2021 then mm -hmm. what I could see is I would like to test drive your services with my own podcast oh, and, wonderful and then thank you promote your services to my list and the authors and of course I'm going to be having a podcast that's, it's going to be designed for authors so somehow yeah. they're likely to hear about you. Absolutely <laughs> I'm going to line up for a, like a monthly segment on your podcast like you know and Dave can have his 10 minutes in the last the episode in the last week of the month. <laughs> Hey, there you go. You can say Dave's dibs or Dave's, yeah, yeah, we can come up with something for that. But I just think it, it, it would be such a natural thing. One of the things I've always been encouraged to do by my, you know, some of my, I have a lot of clients who are like these big million dollar clients. But mm -hmm. here I sit, not doing all those things that they're doing to make the millions. But some of them sure. have told me, you know, Test drive what you're going to promote so that you can promote with vigor and, yep. you know. Um, so Thanks. I am an affiliate of some things that I recommend to my list, but it's only because I like it. I think it is helpful. I think it will help others. So it's not like I'm just trying yes. to push something down your throat. Which never works. Right. Exactly. Right. That just, yeah. It doesn't feel good, nor does it, is it well received because it doesn't feel good. No, so yeah, well, I, yeah. So if I if I'm already and I I noted on one of my blog posts about you know the the one thing that a lot of my authors never mention is Google Play mm -hmm. as a potential for audiobooks. They're only looking uh, at Apple or iTunes. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, or um, Audible. Audible. Audible is the big right, buzzword. Exactly. Exactly. My current distribution is out to uh, the majors. So we do have Amazon Audible. Think of them as being the same company, really. One is owned by the other. As I'm sure you know, when, you, when you're when you published on Amazon, you'll, you'll get a tile for each of your uh, different right. formats. So you'll have your, yeah, your paperback, your print book. You'll still see audio CDs on Amazon to this very day. Yeah which is interesting to me because it means that the author doesn't have the opportunity to have their work published at Audible because Audible only mm. accept digital copies. We're seeing an evolution and a bit of catch up being played by some of the majors, but we get you out to a minimum of those major players. So I think at the moment, the biggest ones are Amazon Audible, iTunes, Google Play and Spotify. They're, they're the four biggest deliverers of audiobook content at the moment but there's another 16 different um, retail outlets international outlets it's uh, it's Nook audiobooks uh, Barnes and Noble scribed there's a very popular um, Danish audiobook site called Storytel and they cannot get enough English speaking content 
And so, and on and on the list goes, there's growing interest in audio books. And so therefore a lot of the traditional publishers are adding an audio book arm, you know, to their yeah. traditional public publishing services. And, and there are also brand new services, which are just about audio books and they're based in all sorts of parts of the world. And among the greatest consumers of audio books are the Germans. The Germans love yeah. English speaking audio books. The German people are, are, have an incredible appetite for audio. I did not know that. I have so, uh, two friends who just moved to Germany, so I'll have to let them know. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. In terms of of distribution, again, as you were pointing out before, Tanya, having having had the experience yourself and gone through the process, this is the only way to learn what the full scope is of of what you might be doing. And certainly as far as your podcast is concerned, without question, I'd be delighted to work through the planning stages and uh, and develop the podcast with you. But as you say, when you are then talking to other people um, who are saying, well, how easy or hard is it to start a podcast? Or really the big question with podcasting, I think, is where do I start? I think that's where a lot of people get stalled. Which is the chicken and which is the egg, you know? Which... <laughs> I get that a yeah, lot which, with which just book through. writing. Yeah. 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 yeah same where, do I, where do I start with this? Absolutely. Is... Absolutely. Totally with you on that point. Experience something yourself. Understand how it is from your client's point of view. And that leaves you in a better position. Also to be more objective about the kind of discussion you're going to have with them as well. Be able to be honest and, uh, and knowledgeable about those things that really look like a good idea at the start, but, you know, once we tested them, you know, not so much, you know, especially as thing, as far as things like marketing are concerned and how to get the word out there about your podcast. And an important part of having your own podcast is actually appearing on other podcasts. True. Very true. And um, I have, I have so much material coming at me about, you know, getting on podcasts and here's the best way to do this and, and yada, yada. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it could just be that this could be the year where that, all that happens. My strongest wish for that one, but as I understand, you're, you're still at the, um, the expression we use in Australia is you're still lining up your ducks. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> as, like, you know, true. just sort of mapping it all out and putting it into the right spot. So. That's so, right. I have a matrix. Um, it's a 10 by 10 matrix for uh, blogging. Uh -huh. so you have a, a hundred topics uh, to to blog about over uh, time. And so I thought I would use that as the base for coming up with my podcast topics as well, because it is going to be this. That will automatically bring some um, some interview guests to mind too, yeah? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's the and I, that's a big part of the planning too, yeah. That's true. Because I need to have an editorial calendar that will um where I can bring in the right people at that right time. Or but of mm. course with the podcast and you can record it whenever and but they are going to want to know when it's going to be distributed because that's when it matters to them. If they're promoting something, you know that's going to come out a couple of weeks after they're due to be on, then that's when they want to be there. Right. So. I think that's a really that. powerful, that's fascinating. You mentioned that Tanya, that one of the, um, and, and I, I must um, start by saying that I, I have no, I have no formal training in sales or marketing. I've, I've worked for organizations before where it's gone on around me, but it's, you know, some of that has, you know, some of that by osmosis maybe maybe has given me some idea of what to do, but but essentially that whole area of the business when I started was I knew I was going to have trouble with that because I had such a small amount of experience in it. So for me, it's been a very um, a very sort of basic but quite laboured process, and I've fortunately had some fabulous connections in business who do have experience in how to do these things. And so to illustrate one of the the concept you're talking about, I think, prior to the podcast series being released, what we tend to find is that a kind of like a little show reel, which maybe runs for a minute, perhaps even shorter than that, where it has two or three really interesting little bits of dialogue or um, so uh, tasters and tempters um, or cliffhangers 
that we actually put together in audio and then we will put the podcast logo and make it into a very, very short video. And what this enables you to do, it enables you to, so for instance, on something like LinkedIn, then just prior to the release of that podcast episode, you can actually release a trailer for, for next week's episode. And what I say to my to my clients is, is I'll produce that video for you, very short. Now you upload it to your social media, make a post about the forthcoming episode, and then if you mention me in, in within the post, not necessarily, you know, Dave's fantastic and we all love him, but something along the lines of, um, you know, we're talking about we're talking about audio audio today, and um, you know, I know this is of interest to Dave. Some a subtle reference, but what that means is that I will be notified as soon as they release their post, and then I can like, comment, and share on that um, on that video trailer for the podcast episode. And spread it out to my uh, my LinkedIn connections. Now, if you extend that idea, where you actually formal sort of at mention in LinkedIn, if you mention the names of your interview guests throughout the podcast or people that you've referred to during the podcast, then all of a sudden they will be notified of the podcast release date. They'll know when it's all about to happen, and they will be able to support your social media. Uh, promotion of that podcast and really all podcasts throughout your series. So that's just one kind of little marketing loop that I've been experimenting with over the last over the last three years, and it seems to get reasonable traction because it's it's you know there's something about the pre-release stage for a product, be it an audio book or a podcast, that if you can catch people's interest prior to it being released, then it has that lovely you know we all love a reveal, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's right. <laughs> and it will inform those guests um, as to when you're, you know, obviously you would you would tell them when you're planning to schedule this, you know, perhaps a number of weeks out. But in the few days prior or in the week prior or whatever, they can have this additional little nudge, which will then give them something to comment on on LinkedIn, which I which I find is an amazing way to generate contacts for, for new business and to, to just uh, learn more about the people that you're associated with and have that conversation in a fairly public kind of fashion? Absolutely. That is definitely mm. good advice. Um, but there's one idea. Yeah, that's just, that's what I've learned from marketing. You know, that's probably just about all of it. <laughs> the rest of it's a mystery to me. <laughs> yeah. I, wow. That, that, that does sound great. I have to tell you, I, I have one other question. Thank you. And I appreciate is, all your time today, Tanya. You've been so generous. Widow. I mean, we've been, I, going, we've, going, we've been going for nearly two hours. You're so, you're so kind to do this. But, yeah, let's, let's, let's hear your final question. I'd love to hear it. Um, it is, is there a, a range of uh, word count that you would do an ebook for? But do you find, like right now on Amazon, there's this whole craze for tiny books, yeah. 10 to 20,000 words or whatever. Yep. Is that, is there a short listen? Oh, wait, I just saw some advertising for something. Oh, maybe that's like ah. Cliffhanger's book or, I mean, a, you know, a Cliff Notes of popular books yeah. and they give it in 15 minutes or yeah. something. So my question yes, is, the, can you do audio books mm, in small, tiny books as well as your typical 50, 90,000 word thing? Can you do small ones and big ones? The answer is, the answer is yes, you can, but you have to be very careful. Um, uh, uh, let, let me start from the beginning just to say that um, just while we're going past this point, Tanya, that I was really interested to hear your story at the beginning of our conversation today, how you mentioned that you went audio book on one of your very early, if, if, I think you said it was your first book you did as audio, is that yes. right? Yes. Now, you, you did you, and you made the audio book after publishing um, the print and perhaps the ebook version? Correct. This was after, you made the audio book afterwards? Okay. Yes. So, um, one of the questions I'm getting from authors now is that, is they're saying, look, I've been I've been through the writing process, I've been through the editorial, um, I've been through all of the all of the edit runs, and I've actually got something which is very close to my fa final manuscript. But at this stage, 
if I just park the process there as far as the print and ebook are concerned, stop there, I've already got my content together, can I then go and do the audio book and just release the audio book by itself without the print and ebook version? Mm -hmm. And it's always a, an interesting question and it sounds a little bit a little bit backwards, but just so that all of our potential listeners know, you can do that at Amazon at the moment. We can publish you direct to um, to Amazon. So you'll be on Amazon and Audible with just an audio book. You can release an audio book only. So that's point one. The second, the second point is that I'm noticing now there's a tendency now for authors who have written longer books. So where we're sort of heading up to the uh, so if it's self-help self -help or business, some of them have written, you know, beautiful thesis length books. So they're, they're sort of 90,000, 100,000, 110,000 words. It's a big commitment and that's a long audio book and, you know, and that and that and that. So what they decide to do is actually to write a an abridged version. There are two options. They can write an abridged version of their book where they can condense the entire book down to say maybe the length that you're talking about, maybe 10 to 20,000 words. So you can release an abridged version and eventually you can release the full version as well. So you can have an abridged audio book and you can have the full version, release that at some later date if you wish to. The other option is to release it in audio chapter by chapter. And as long as you're quite clear in the title for Amazon, that this is chapter one, this is chapter two, this is chapter three, then you can actually release the book as an audio book series if you wish to, which has that, you mentioned cliffhanger. If it's done well, it can have that kind of, right, well, I've got my Audible subscription. I listened to chapter one of Tanya's book last month and, oh, my goodness, I'm going to have to pick another book for my next month audio book from Audible on my subscription and um, oh, look at that! I've found on social media that Tanya is going to release release chapter two of the book on this particular date. And we so they're the two different ones. Yeah, well, that's all. It just generates a bit of anticipation. Yeah, a little bit of mystery, or and it's and it's in a sense, it's it's kind of like doing it as a um, a serial, what we, what we call in Australian television a, a serial. So n not necessarily a series of independent episodes, but um, the story told week by week by, or month by month by month. So there's some there's some options there. So so I think in terms of short in terms of short, yes, that's that's where the the trend's going. And it also gives the author the opportunity to do a bit of a road test, Tanya. So let's again, I'm I'm not I'm picking on you for the model. You may get to you may get to chapter three and you've released those three chapters over over three months. And you've had a look at how the audiobook sales are going and you're sort of going, well, you know, it's kind of worked, but, it, you know, do I want to go ahead and, you know, finish off the last ten, nine chapters or do I let my let my public know that that was that that was the end of, of that that kind of um, this is the end of the cliffhanger series. And then in two months time, um, you can get a discount on my audiobook, which is going to be, you know, blah, blah. And that's where you get the remaining nine chapters. So you can kind of uh, tempt your audience in some of those ways. But yes, certainly abridged audiobooks are, are becoming very, very popular. And um, and for people like yourself who do, who does write and ghostwrite, it's another opportunity for a um, for uh, for some more writing for some more writing income to actually produce that abridged condensed version of the of the book because as you as i'm sure you know it's it's not just a matter of you know topping and tailing it and you know putting in chapter one the middle chapter and the last chapter i mean that's not going to tell the story exactly. <laughs> it's a craft indeed wow wow okay that that's going to be good information to have i'm, I'm wonderful getting ideas yeah, look, thank you so much for your time, Tanya. It's just been so delightful to meet you and um, and to hear your insights into into how your your career has been. I um I must confess that I am a terrible reader. I um one of the reasons I'm in this audio game is that I think my learning my learning channel is my ears, not not really my eyes. I think I learn most from from storytelling. So I often have to um, confess that. Uh, I've probably read maybe 10 novels, like 
I, I've read for pleasure probably 10 times during my life, but the rest of it, you know, as you'd know from your professional um, services days with auditing and things like that, I've written lots of, you know, and the learning and development stuff you've done. I've, I've read technical manual after technical manual after technical manual, and I can do all that for work, but I don't associate reading with pleasure, but I do associate storytelling with, with pleasure. So I hope that doesn't make me a, a foe of the literary community. <laughs> No, no, it does not. It's just, it's not oh, for everyone. Good. And, you know, heck, um, you're, you're producing the audiobooks. You're listening to a lot of things as it is. What do you need to sit down oh. and read them for? Well, and that's well, the that's same true. thing that I get asked all the time because I'm, I'm an editor and I'm reading books constantly. So they mm. ask, you know, have you read this fiction author? And I'm like, I don't have time for play. I was like, I, I'm, reading, I'm reading mostly nonfiction for my work. I read nonfiction yes. for myself so that I can learn something, do something, be something better. So I don't have time for the playful fluff stuff so much. Yeah, that's What's it's interesting, say? isn't it? That's right. Yeah, no, true. No, you're right. I think that's um, it's hard to get that get that mix right. But um, I imagine it's um, similar for you as well. Is that it's not just a matter of reading, you know, particularly when you're editing the information. It's, it's not a matter of just reading it and, you know, correcting for spelling errors. I mean, you've got to understand and comprehend. So I find the same with the audio books is that it, during the editing process, I do a the final process is called a listen through. So from the very beginning of the audio book right to the very end. And I listen to it as a listener would. So I'm wanting to absorb the information that's been conveyed to me. I want to understand what the book's about as well. So. It's a, a tremendous free education, actually. Been amazing that way. There are right. there are things that uh, <laughs> things that I understand that you know I just didn't understand four years ago. That's right. I have had the pleasure of like one of my recent uh, Simon and Schuster authors. Uh, the pleasure mm -hmm. of learning million dollar tips, you know, before yeah. the rest of the world and. Um, and also just being privy to so much great content uh, in the work that I do because I, I attract to me awesome authors and people uh, positive words that are going to make a positive impact on others. And so because of that, I get to listen, read. I, now I'm wanting to listen to it with your audio but I get to read a lot of great content. Uh -huh. so, Fantastic, Tanya. That's great. Yeah. So there's lots of there's there's lots of lots of things about our endeavours which are very similar. It's lovely to compare notes about the nature of the work. I think it is. It is. So we definitely have to have a follow up um, and stay in touch. I mean, let's just you know keep working towards uh, sharing you and your work and your expertise. And by the way, speaking of which, can Thank you me. send me a mm -hmm. link? I, to like a, an audio book or something that you've done that yeah. I could listen yes, to. Yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yep. That'd be awesome because sure, that might stimulate you. or that might make other sparks fly in my head because uh, there have already sure. been some and I believe um, that there might be some great ways for us to collaborate. Fantastic, yeah, yep. no, more than happy to do all of those things. Awesome, awesome. Yep. All no right. Now I have to go put on a, a totally different hat for uh, another okay. meeting that I'm about to go into. Um, but I am so grateful for your time today. I've totally oh, enjoyed it. And thank you, and, and the same to you. The same to you. What wonderful to one. You're you're a wonderful storyteller, um, Tanya. I think you're you're so natural to um, have some you know some lovely monologue episodes for your podcast but also being such a lovely interviewer i think it's a powerful set of skills to apply to a podcast it almost guarantees its success i think wonderful thank you so much i appreciate that mm. thank you so much okay well wonderful, wonderful tanya yeah, have a great have so a much. great remainder of your day yeah you thanks for being thing. so generous with all your time all righty all right. all right thanks again bye now bye bye bye, bye, -bye.